There have been many physical final series over the years, but since the 1980s, the most fouls committed by a team over a six-game series was the Dallas Mavericks in 2006 and by the Indiana Pacers in 2000. Both of those teams had one thing in common. They were both trying to contain the diesel Shaquille O'Neal. At the end of the day, Shaq was arguably the most unstoppable force in NBA Finals history, kind of like the unstoppable force of Raid Shadow Legends. Every great game has some serious challenges waiting near the end, something you can really dig your teeth into if you want to master it. Well, in Raid Shadow Legends, that end game is the Doom Tower, and it's a heck of a ride. This huge tower is basically a giant prison. The Arbiter fought a pack of really nasty bad guys a long time ago, but she wasn't strong enough to take them out for good, so instead, she locked them up in a massive super tower until she figured out how to deal with them. Well, it's been around a few thousand years, and there's still a Doom Tower, so I guess we know how that went. What's worse, now that Sarath is leaking back into the world, the Arbiter doesn't have the power to keep the wards up. So the Doom Tower is failing, and it's up to us to go in there and knock some heads before they get out. I could go on for ages talking about the lore and the joys of the gameplay mechanics, but the real fun is trying these things and experimenting for yourself. And this month, Raids just released a giant new feature, Awakening, and a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you're good enough to take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff, being able to awaken your champions. Awakening your champions lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle. But wait, here's the big news. Raid has just released a super-powered legendary version of everybody's favorite champion, Death Knight. And the best part is, everyone can get him for free just by logging in. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and October 27th, and you'll add Ultimate Death Knight to your collection easy. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50 5 star ascension. Promo code is available for both new and existing players. Click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Rector Dre, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here, and it's that easy. Just click the link in the description, and I'll see you in the game. There have been many explosive scorers throughout the league's history, but there are few players who could score in bunches while remaining extremely efficient. For example, Tracy McGrady had just 8 games in his career where he scored at least 40 points while shooting at least 60% from the field. Impressively, Kobe had 23 of those games. And well beyond that is Michael Jordan, who had 70 games where he scored at least 40 points on at least 60% shooting from the field. To put that in perspective, throughout his career, LeBron James has a total of 69 games where he scored at least 40 points. And that's in total, regardless of efficiency. Which means that Michael Jordan has more 40-point games of at least 60% efficiency than LeBron James has 40-point games in total. That is one efficiently explosive score, to say the least. To championship contending teams, the regular season is often viewed as a time for fine-tuning and chemistry building before the playoff stretch. Well, apparently, this past season's Golden State Warriors didn't even need it. Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green are often recognized as the three best players on the Warriors roster. And throughout the entirety of this past regular season, those three players were all together on the court for a total of just 11 minutes. They didn't even spend a full quarter on the court together before the playoffs started. It's even crazier than that, though. Due to injuries, not only did the three stars only play 11 minutes together this past regular season, but in the past three regular seasons combined, they only played a total of 11 minutes together. When you consider how little time they had to work on their chemistry, it really does add another level of respect to their 2022 championship run. Winning the NBA's MVP award is a difficult thing to do, but far more difficult than that is winning the league MVP while playing all 82 games during the regular season. No one has done that for nearly a decade and a half. The last player to do it was the Mamba, Kobe Bryant, in the 07-08 season. 
Throughout the years, there have been quite a few players with a short temper, which has cost their teams many points due to all of their technical fouls. With that being said, here is the list of the top 10 players with the most technical fouls in NBA history. Not a ton of surprises on the list. What is interesting though, is that 7 out of these 10 players actually played at the power forward position. Do you think that's just a coincidence, or is there some specific reason for it? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. By the way it's glamorized, and how often we've all seen the clip, you would think that Michael Jordan was the first player to dunk from the free throw line in a professional dunk contest. Well although some of you already know this fact, some others may not. It was actually Dr. J, Julius Irving, who was the first player to dunk from the free throw line in a professional dunk contest. It was the ABA's dunk contest in 1976, which, interestingly enough, took place during halftime of the 1976 ABA All-Star Game. Imagine today's modern dunk contests taking place during halftime of the All-Star Game. Not sure if I would prefer that, but that would certainly make for an exciting break. Given how much the Lakers sucked the last couple years, the 2020 championship seems like quite the distant memory, which is why I think many people forget just how dominant that team was throughout the season. And one fact that really illustrates that is this one. Throughout the regular season and the playoffs, the 2020 Lakers had the lead at the end of three quarters on 57 different occasions, and the Lakers ended up winning the game all 57 times. They literally never blew a lead throughout the entire season and postseason. They're the only team in league history to never blow a lead in the fourth quarter. There have been a lot of long and dramatic finishes, but one game specifically required more overtimes than any other game of NBA history. It took place long before the popularity of the game exploded, and unfortunately, we have no available footage of this game, at least that I could find. It was in 1951 between the Indiana Olympians and the Rochester Royals. The close battle went for a whopping total of six overtimes. The crazy thing is, as lengthy and as close as that game was, it was also incredibly low scoring, as the Olympians won the game 75-73. In the entirety of the second and fourth overtime, neither team scored. And before you think it was because both teams were bad, the Royals actually went on to win the NBA championship that season. Being a dominant offensive player is hard to do, and so is being dominant defensively. But being dominant on both ends of the court simultaneously is especially difficult. In the last 15 years, no player has averaged at least 30 points per game while making the NBA's first team all defense. The last player to do that was the dynamic two-way player Kobe Bryant in 2007. The player who most recently did it before that was again Kobe Bryant in 2006, and before that, Kobe Bryant in 2003. Goes to show just how rare of a talent the Mamba truly was. It's a simple rule in the NBA, if you get 6 personal fouls, you're disqualified from the game, usually. In 2014, the league had to make an exception and enforce a little known rule. During a regular season match with the Cleveland Cavaliers, the struggling and injury-laden Lakers only had 8 players to suit up for the game. With just over 3 minutes left in the 4th quarter, the Lakers' Robert Sacre received his 6th personal foul, which meant that under normal circumstances, he would be disqualified from the game. The thing is, the Lakers' Chris Kamen had already fouled out, and their other role players, Nick Young and Jordan Farmar, had sustained in-game injuries that sent them to the locker room. That means that the Lakers only had 5 available players before Sacre's 6th foul. If he had been disqualified for his 6th, the Lakers would have only had 4 players, which is too few to have on the court. Well according to the NBA rulebook, in this situation, if a team lacks a replacement player, said player shall remain in the game and shall be charged with a personal foul and a team foul. Even though Robert Sacre received his 6th foul, hypothetically, he could have received 106 fouls and he still would have remained in the game. Seems like an interesting exploit that could have been put to use during the Hackashack era. There are blockbuster trades, there are three team deals, and then there's whatever the hell happened in 2005. It was the largest trade in NBA history centered around quality pieces like Jason Williams and Antoine Walker. In total, 5 teams were involved and 13 players. On the screen is the list of the teams and players. 
Sometimes it seems nearly impossible for just two teams to agree upon terms, but somehow all five managed to make it work on this one. I can only imagine the amount of phone calls and hours that went into a deal like this. Steph Curry is really good at making three-point shots. In fact, he's the greatest to ever do it. Ben Simmons, on the other hand, not so much. So the question is, if Ben Simmons was determined to break Steph's three-point record at all costs, just how long would he have to play in order to do it? Well, the short answer is a really long time. But to be more specific, he would have to play roughly 171,000 games, around 2,500 seasons, and he would break the record around the year 4514. So keep it up, Ben. Just remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So now it's your turn. Do you guys have any new facts to share with the rest of us? Let us know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.